Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm William Becker, your host, and I have today as my guest the very talented, lovely, and charming Karen Frazier. And uh, it's a special treat for me to have Karen on the show today because um, we go back a long way and we've spent time together that has been part of my own um, coming of age as a professional. Um, we've we met under interesting circumstances very good interesting and um it, it's been all wonderful since then so karen welcome and thank you for being on thanks william how are you i'm great how are you doing i'm well please ignore the thing that looks like bigfoot walking around in the background that's just jim okay and yeah jim isn't a bigfoot he is karen's husband so um, that's the rumor. Yeah. That's your story and you're sticking to it. <laughs> yes. So um, you've just gotten back from the ghost conference in, in Seaside. Mm -hmm. And you've, these are a lot of work always. Mm -hmm. And you've managed to survive. Mostly. Yeah, okay. got a little bit of the crud, but uh, not COVID, just the crud, but uh -huh. we're, we're surviving. Good. And, um, and you know me, I jump around. That's just the way my you brain works. You do you, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. And um, one of the uh, people are sharing, wonderful. Karen is a very well-known and an incredible and very prolific author. Um, this is your latest book, and I don't know if you've got another one out since then. This one just came out, but no, I had two come out about the same time. Okay, um, I'm pardon me, I'm sharing while I'm talking, so okay, um, so that it can go out on my thing. So that one, Essential Crystal Meditation. So I know you've heard me say this before, William, about like all of my books, so I apologize, but this is one of my favorite books I've ever written. Uh -huh. Um, I absolutely love it. Oh, I can't figure out how to share it via my author page, or I absolutely would. So I'll just have to share it later. Um, anyway, so, um, I think you know this about me. Meditation is something that has been difficult for me throughout my entire life, but something that I've always been told that I must do, um, which made me mad because I don't like being, don't tell me what to do. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and so I was often, um, almost a resentful meditator because it would just be, because I couldn't do it. I thought I had the belief that I couldn't do it. And what I discovered is that even though I don't do it traditionally, I am a big meditator and I do it through things like movement meditation and all sorts of other stuff. And so, um, I combined what I've come to understand about this essential practice in my life of meditation and combine that with one of my first loves which is crystals so it's i'm i'm really excited to share it with people it's got really doable meditations for various things and um if you feel like you can't meditate this may be the book for you <laughs> well i think it's one of my favorites too that you've written um oh thank you you're welcome and except for maybe the ones i mentioned in oh you know, yeah you are yeah I guys got to have an ego. I do have a chapter in one of her books. It's uh, not a long chapter, but it's a chapter. Dancing with the afterlife, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, the William chapter. Yeah, and um, those were the it, unusual circumstances under which we met. That was do you realize that was twelve years ago? I believe it. Mm -hmm. I believe it. So, um, yeah, and I think you. Why don't you tell about that? I mean, that was such a big part of your life. That place. It still is. It still is. It's, yeah. It still is. It's actually kind of what sparked um, everything that came after it, right? So mm -hmm. first of all, I believe that everything in our life leads to everything else. And I, I don't believe that we have any mistakes or make any mistakes in our life. Sorry, my earbud is popping out. Apparently, I have the wrong size on it the little oh. i don't need what do you call the little the rubber thing that, anyway i don't know um but so i i so i'm a big believer that that when there are no mistakes in life and everything leads to everything else but my very first book um 
was a book about a place called Wellington. It's here in Washington state. Um, you and I have been there together many times, yes. but it is also how we met. Now, were you at that conference that I spoke about it, that John was at with Rocky? Were you with them? Where it was, was that one? Mount Hood. No. I Okay. I was giving tours, I think. Okay. For Rocky's company that weekend or something. Okay. Anyway, so sorry, we're talking like everybody knows what we're talking about. You probably don't. <laughs> sorry. I also, when you get two people who are psychic, who have like zero attention span because things bombard us, we tend to do this. Exactly. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, so I was uh, writing for a magazine called Paranormal Underground. Perhaps you've heard of it. I believe you write for them occasionally as well, don't you, William? Yeah, I do. Yes. And so at the time I was writing for a magazine called Paranormal Underground, I was sort of in this very, um, I would say, paracurious place. And I knew that my life had been unusual. I had had a lot of experiences um, and I had a lot of indication that I was a psychic and an empath and things like that, although I was not in a place of belief where I would claim that because it felt just weird. Um, but I was trying everything um, and writing about it. So I was the paranormal adventurer who would try something and then write about it for the magazine. So I did things like I had a past life regression hypnotherapy session and I wrote about that, which was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, a whole nother story. And um, so one of the things I did is I participated in a paranormal investigation with a local team. They're defunct. They're no longer together. Um, but we went to a place in Puyallup, Washington called Meeker Mansion. And um, I interviewed them. They let me participate in the investigation kindly. And then during the course of the interview, I said, well, tell me about like the best piece of piece of evidence you've ever had. And they said, oh, well, I think it's... Um, an EVP and a video that we got at Wellington. And I said, well, what's Wellington? And like my spidey sense went off. As uh -huh. soon as they said at Wellington, I was like, oh, what's Wellington? And they went on to explain that this was the site of an avalanche disaster. Um, and that about a hundred people had died and that it's incredibly haunted. And um, it's up in, in Stevens Pass uh, in the mountains in North Cascades of Washington state. And so this was in February. And um, you cannot get into hiking trails in the North Cascades in no. February. And so, but I became obsessed with it. And I kept saying to Jim, you've got to get me up there. You've got to get me up there. So we finally got up there July 11th. And I mean, I was very singularly focused on getting there. Like, can we get up there now? No. Can we get up there now? No. Can we get up there now? Do you want a snowshoe in? No. <laughs> so, um, and so I was so focused on this place. So when I went up there, all of a sudden, it was like everything I thought I had known, um, but never wanted to admit I believed was true. And um, by that, I mean that there are spirits and they talk to us and they communicate with us and that bodily con or, um, consciousness survives bodily death. And Wellington was this place where all of a sudden, all of these things that I wanted to believe were true, didn't admit I believed. Um, even to myself, suddenly crystallized into this thing that I knew and I understood, and it was very real to me. And um, so we live three and a half hours away in a town called Chehalis, Washington, which is a um, little teeny town in, in Western Washington along the Interstate 5 corridor. And um, we would drive up there virtually every weekend, three and a half hours. We would pack the kids in the car. We had tweens, tweens and teens at the time, we would pack the kids friends in the car, we would get home sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, the kids would sleep in the car. Um, and we would go up to Wellington every single weekend. And um, I decided I was going to film a documentary about it, because I'm such a great documentarian. We'd never mm -hmm. filmed a documentary before we didn't have but we what we had was a friend who um, had gone to film school and um, who wanted to be a DP, a director of photography on this, uh, this thing. And so we bought equipment, we went up and we assembled a group of people and we started filming. Well, for reasons beyond my control, um, the documentary blew up and I was devastated and I cried and cried and cried and felt like I'd lost my, you know, 
lost my best friend and it, it was horrible. And this was in the middle of the winter when we couldn't get back up to Wellington, of course, after I'd been there all summer. Right. And um, so I thought, well, you know, I guess it's a book. And so I wrote a book instead. And the book is called Avalanche of Spirits. And um, I went and was invited to speak in early spring of 2010 at um, a local ghost conference called the Mount Hood Ghost Conference near Mount Hood in Oregon. And some friends of yours came and heard me speak. And we're very excited about the information that I shared in the EVPs I shared in the video and the images. And so they were very excited about this because what I did was I took, we filmed a lot up there. So I took bits and pieces from the documentary and used those for my presentation. And so they were very excited and um, they came up just as soon as they could, which was when you came up and you came up yes. the next year. And I will let you pick up the story from there because all I knew was here was this group of guys that were coming up there whose truck had overheated at the pass. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And we finally got there. Rob St. Helena and Rocky were in one truck, I think. I mm-hmm. think that was the trip they went up on. Or Rocky. Yeah, it was you and Rocky and John and yeah. Um, Rob. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was in the truck with John and that truck did overheat. Um, so we were a little bit concerned, but we got down there. Everything was fine. And John and I were talking, and I'm one of these people that, you know, a little ADHD. I focus on something. Nothing else exists. And I was focused on the conversation. And so we get there and open the door in this parking lot. And he says, well, and it's like, well, what? <laughs> Oh, we're here. Ah, okay. Switch gears. And I met you and Jim and the other people that were there. Um, I'm a Portland city boy. And being out in the middle of nowhere with people I don't know. And because there are bears and cougars, everybody wears guns. I'm going, okay, I'm going to (laughs) die. Yeah. So just, just for context, just so people know, um, because we're not gun crazy. No, you're you're not people. Um, this was a, uh, in the middle of the mountains, a very remote location in the middle of the mountains. And we were going to be there after dark. Exactly. And because we were going to be there after dark, we had had a cougar drop down on us the year before. And right. we realized that we probably needed to. Uh, I was carrying bear spray and we realized that perhaps we needed to carry something a little more robust. A little heavy. Right. And they're wonderful people I totally trust and, and all of that now. But, you know, the, the Portland city boy goes, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry (laughs) yeah that's fine it's it's part of what part of the story for me now that's so funny because such wonderful people and um we well i wandered around the parking lot with people and for the most part all the buildings are gone there's there's oh some of the equipment for the engines and the water tower and stuff but the hotels and the school and the houses and I mean everything else there's nothing there to recognize there's a foundation a, there is a foundation as you walk down towards the snow shed right that's a mm-hmm. little bit past yeah um but we walked around the parking lot and I was describing the activities that I felt at these different places and then we went down and um, went through the snowshed, which they put up after the avalanche. A little to protect bit. the trains coming through. By the way, it's not a railroad track anymore. Don't go hiking on railroad tracks at night. It is exactly. now a rail to trails. It's it's a it's a trail. Exactly. And there's no track there at all. Nothing mm-hmm. like that. So good good reminder. I forget people do that. Um, and people get killed doing that. Exactly. Yeah. And. Paranormal hunters get killed doing that. So it's a really good Mm -hmm. thing to do. Um, And we had a lot of experiences in that tunnel. Things that I saw and things that I read that matched up with what other people had always been getting there. And then we got down, climbed down what? How far is that down? 50, 100 feet? That's about 100 feet down from um, where the trains. So basically the trains were parked on a um a passing track that was sitting along the edge of a, a 
cliff down above a river. Mm -hmm. um, and when the avalanche came down from the mountains above, it was a big half mile long avalanche um, that was very heavy because it had been snowing about an inch an hour for like 10 days or something like that. Lost my earbud again. Uh -oh. um, nah, we're good. Anyway, so, uh, so, and then it started raining and a lightning strike caused the avalanche. And so this big, wet mass of thick, heavy snow, trees and rocks actually came tumbling down the hill and um, swept two trains and a uh, snowplow down into the, down by the river off of the tracks. And so we went down to where the trains had come to rest and there's still debris down there. Right. And mm -hmm. you leave the debris alone. It's against yeah. the law to take anything out. And it's mm -hmm. morally and ethically wrong to take anything out. So mm -hmm. go explore and leave it alone. But I was picking up on different people down there in ages and occupations and gender and all kinds of things. And then we looked at the back of Karen's book and it all matched. Because I had and done quite a bit of research by then to, to, to know who these people were. Exactly. And I'd had people telling me for a long time I should start going professional. but that night really proved it to myself that okay yep i can i can go pro now and so karen and that adventure is a huge part of my shifting i've been doing i've been working on the psychic work and such since my late teenage years but the, that was the break to switch from amateur to professional and uh so i'm always grateful that's a hard shift to make i yeah. mean um, you know, I had the same. I had people telling me for years, you need to be doing readings. You And um, I really only have started doing readings in the last two years. Uh, right. I did them for my friends and family. I did tarot readings. I did all of that. But I didn't do readings, readings, right? For people right. who, um, and um, that's a very, it just feels scary to make that shift for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Well, part of the thing with this is, you really, when you're doing a reading for somebody, you're really putting yourself out in the line and your ego, and you can be wrong. I mean, everybody's wrong sometimes. It's okay and to be wrong. Um, it is, but it takes getting used to the, the idea that it's okay to be wrong. To not hear that wah wah every time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, what I, what, I'll tell you when I find that I'm wrong is mm -hmm. when I stop reporting exactly what I'm noticing and mm -hmm. start trying to interpret it. Right. If I report exactly what I notice, what I see, hear, taste, smell, feel, sense, um, exactly as I see it. So if I see um, three triangles um, and in the desert, three triangles, and I report it as three, and here the month of November, and I report, I see three triangles, it feels like the desert, and it, I wrote down the month of November, here, let me show you, and I, I draw it, and I show them a picture, um, and I let them fill in the blanks, so that was in a reading I did where the, the person I was reading said, oh, well, I'm going to Egypt in November, is that it? And I said, I don't know, is it? <laughs> and the Great Pyramid of Giza has two pyramids right with it that's perfect yeah i know but but if i had have tried to interpret that because my mind as i was doing this i was like well mountains in the desert <laughs> you know so yeah. i would have been completely wrong i would have said well hey there's i'm I, you're going to some mountains in the desert but instead i drew it and i showed it to her and i've had things like that happen before as well as soon as i start trying to interpret the information i'm receiving and give it a story or make it fit in some greater context i'm wrong yeah yeah we can't mm -hmm. we can't decide sometimes we receive things symbolically that i have at times that i'll have to put it out there and mm -hmm. just as what it is and except sometimes the symbolism means something to me so i can say it's like this uh, you know like it this I can, yeah yeah i mean like the desert thing i it feels like the desert to me that was just mm -hmm. i mean you know based on what i understand the desert feels like and that's how i felt yeah so yeah there is some level of interpreting in that way but what i mean is when i try to 
turn it into any kind of a story, right? Oh, as opposed right. to as opposed to just these are the symbols I'm seeing. This is normally what the symbol means for me, but it may mean something different for you. So right. there is some level always of interpretation going on for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's a different level of interpretation. It's not the um, ego driven. This is the story. And I know all of this. And, you know, because I see things very quickly, I get very quick flashes of things. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the the things that stick around the most for me, honestly, is where I feel it in my body, unfortunately. So my aches and pains go away when I read other people, but I get all theirs instead. So, <laughs> but the rest comes really quick, comes and goes very, very quickly. So I have to write it down or draw it or something as soon as I receive it. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, do yeah. you ask it can to come back sometimes or, hey, wait a minute, I didn't get all that. Tell me more. Show me more. Um, yeah, but typically I, as soon as I, as soon as I, I just write a word or something and I've gotten pretty good at capturing it and just, um, not needing to, mm -hmm. but the other thing is sometimes it'll come so fast and go away so fast that, that sometimes that may not be for that person. That may be something entirely different. Right. Yeah. Well, and especially if you're in a place that has a lot of activity or a lot of entities already there. Who knows? Or if you're in a, a large setting where people are there to have like a gallery reading or yeah. different kinds of things or a conference, yeah. they can get. Yeah. Haunted places are very different for me. Um, so when I'm doing a reading and I do them online right now, um, I don't I, I, I can do them face to face, but mm -hmm. just, you know, we've been home a lot. Um, right. And so, but when I'm in a space and reading a space, it is a very different experience for me than when I'm having a conversation, doing a reading, because right. um, I feel it, I, my spidey sense is what I call it, where my, I feel things in my body, I, uh, I can walk into a room and be like, holy crap, someone's in here, and just because I feel it, um, and I typically um, get ideas and thoughts fully formed and immediately understand the story you know you've walked through places with me and seen me right. do that it's very i don't do that in reading i do that when i'm in a space where i can walk right. into a space and i can be like well this didn't used to this house didn't used to look like this it used to be oriented differently and there was something happened in this closet and i mean so for some reason being in a space an energetic space um i read much differently than when i'm sitting and talking face to face to a person do you yeah yeah, mm -hmm. I think so. And um, it's a different kind of communication. If anybody in that space is talking to me, it's different than the other. Um, yeah, it's more a reading, cognizance for me. I just know. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'll see it, but it's, yeah, it's very different. And mm -hmm. it also means sometimes you're driving down the street and get shot and... Well, you know, we used to, when we would drive places together, remember the game yeah. we would play? That place yeah. is haunted. <laughs> yeah, and we'd read what was there and the whole bit. <laughs> when we would drive places, we would pick out haunted places as we went yeah. past them. Yep. Yeah, it was great fun. And going to Tokeland one time, and it was a dark and stormy night, and there was a guy in the middle of the road on Highway 6 on the way to Raymond. He was transparent which is why I knew his shotgun wasn't going to actually hurt. I and, know exactly where you're talking about, William. Uh-huh. <laughs> I believe it. So and every time uh, we go past there, I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I think it was a land dispute or something that, that mm -hmm. this was a residual activity from something like that. I didn't take it personally. Yeah, and I know exactly hurt. where. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. where you're talking about. That's mm -hmm. so funny. Because I, I pointed out to Jim all the time. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what happened there, but we'll. So. Yeah, I, exactly. And, you know, that was the first time I'd had an experience quite like that. So I was a little unsure about just how this was going to go. And, um, yeah, Tokeland Hotel is great. They've got new. Tokeland Hotel now. is cool. It, it's cool. Um, the rooms are a little cold in the spring, so layers. Um, but walls it is are thin. Walls are thin. That's right, and you share a bathroom. 
But right. other than that, it's a neat place. It's got a great history. It's very charming. And um, I definitely have had some experiences there. I, yeah, I have too. Yeah. And I've taught classes there mm -hmm. twice, I think. And mm -hmm. I would like to do that again. Actually. Yeah. I, yeah, it's pretty cool. I see you were just at um, Wolf Creek Inn. Were you at yes. Wolf Creek Inn? Yes. I had to it's take It's an interesting in. place. Yeah, yes. it's 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 kind of it's kind of a cool place. I've stayed there once. I've been there a few times to eat and things as well mm -hmm. and kind of wandered through. It's definitely got some stuff going on. I've had an experience every time I've well, we didn't have one I don't think this last time psychically I did, but not physically. Mm -hmm. But I I've stayed there a few times. I've taught there twice, so that's overnight and Devin and I went once to explore it first and talk to the owners in person. And um, that day, I think I saw the piano man. And Oh, in the, uh, in the parlor? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've had my door unlock, my, my room door. I've had it be open when I've come back up after breakfast. Um, I can't remember... If I've had anybody sit on the bed there like I did in um, Sumter. But, um, yeah, it's it's a great place. Um, the new owners of the hotel. It, now, this is a place. State Parks owns the building. It's a state I thought park. it was owned by the National Park Service. I think it's State Parks. Oh, okay. I could be wrong. I could be I, wrong. I'm yeah, not going to swear to that. I think it might be that. NPS. Yeah. yeah. Either way, it's not an individual, but they have a, a private company, which is basically a husband and wife team and staff that own the right. business end of it. Right. And I went to, they took over just a year ago, and I was talking to them then about doing another event there, and they said, wait, and then COVID happened, so... I figured it'd be Viv Vivian Powell's a dear friend of mine that's in from England visiting. And I thought, ah, this would be someplace new that we could take um, her. Yeah, it's it's cool. And it's pretty. It's historic. Um, you know, Clark Gable slept there. So, woo. Right. And they have the Jack London room. And, you know, and um, the grounds are gorgeous. And you'll see wildlife. And the food is good. It's 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 a fun little place to stay. It doesn't have a lot of rooms, um, no. so but you got to reserve early. And they are in suite, which helps. Yes. And, um, that in fact they've closed off all the bunk rooms now. They don't they don't use those for people, which yeah. really helps on the noise. They're also not pushing the paranormal piece. Yeah, they're that, a lot of places do that, so I get yeah, that. Yeah, they're allowing the right people to come in and do things. But sure. I guess there were some problems that developed. I don't know. Well, um, that's not surprising to me. Um, you know, there there is a certain amount of that that follows when a place um, advertises itself or puts itself out there as haunted, especially a place that's open to the public. Exactly. Yes. And we did go to Golden oh, as well. Oh, Golden is, Golden's fun. Yeah. And we, we got to see... Um, Turkeys, wild turkeys running around. Oh. Well, they weren't running. They were strutting around. And I actually got to see one spread its tail feathers for a few seconds, which I hadn't seen before. Oh, yeah. It's cool, right? Yeah. Because Sumter has lots of wild turkeys, but I've never seen them spread the tail feathers. It's It was fantastic. So Cool. Yeah. And see, people, this is how Karen and I tend to talk. We wander <laughs> through these subjects. So. Um, Anyway, it's part of our charm. It's um, part of, yes. If anybody and, can follow us, good on you. Oh. Exactly. Now, um, what got you into crystals? Now, Karen and dreams. I'm going to preface this with um, Karen is my go-to person for crystals. With people, when I have clients that have questions about crystals and dreams. She's the ones I send them to because she's literally written the book on them multiple times. And so, um, and it's not the same book. And <laughs> there are I a should, few. 
Yeah, and I should say um, that um, Karen's books are part of what I like about them is they're approachable for everybody. The she's not talking down to those who are well experienced, but she's not over the head of people that are beginners. So they're good resources and interesting reads for anybody thank at you. any level. No, thank you. I wanted I'm to I'm sitting here out. playing with a crystal as we're talking, by the way. Why am I not surprised? I got a few of them here, but yeah, I'm just sitting here. This is a piece of kunzite and I like to it's kind of a blade and I just sort of <laughs> Yeah, I like it. You go to her house and the china cabinets aren't filled with beautiful crystal and silver pieces. They're full of beautiful crystals. I actually gave my grandmother's china to my niece so that I had room for my crystals in my china cabinet. True stories. I best protection it. crystals. Best protection crystals, I actually think, are hematite. Um, either the red hematite or the magnetic kind, the kind that's kind of silvery. Um, and black tourmaline and shungite. Um, I especially really like shungite right now. I'm kind of I kind of feeling it because it's also very grounding. I like that name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, how did you get interested in the dreams and the crystals? Um, I so I was as a kid, a rock hound. I was the kid who was always bringing rocks home. Um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest on the coast. I spent a lot of time on rocky beaches combing through for agates, but I would pick up any rock I thought was cool. Had a big box of rocks in my basement um, of my parents' house when I was growing up. I just have always really, really, really loved rocks. What's funny about that is I took a geology class when I was in college, and I hated it. Really? Um, yeah, but it was because it wasn't taught to me in a way that was interesting. So, um, but yeah, I took a geology class when I was in college, didn't like it, but I've always been super interested in rocks. Um, and I just started encountering crystals like all the time. And then I started dreaming about them. And so I started to try to learn about them as much as I could. And um, it just kind of flowed from there. I mean, I don't think I ever it just so like everything in my life William honestly is just sort of stuff that has come in the flow right um right I've never really sought any of it out it just sort of happened so like with the dream interpretation um mm -hmm. I started because I am an incredibly vivid dreamer uh and I would wake up and think holy crap what did I eat before I went to bed Mm -hmm. And um, so I also have an interest in Carl Jung and um, his some of his symbology. I'm interested in Edgar Cayce and the sleeping prophet and the things he saw when he was asleep. And all of those things just led to me to start actually just trying to figure out my own dreams. And I did okay. that for years. And then I would start to have friends who would say, hey, I had this dream. Can you figure it out for me? Um, and I would figure out my friend's dreams and it just kind of all led naturally to the dream interpretation thing because our dreams tell us so much stuff about what's going on under the surface and the things that we're not w willing to acknowledge in our waking lives. Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Let me see. Here's. Should I move them? And what are your thoughts on Moldavite? Okay. So Moldavite is a tektite. It is caused by a meteorite impact with the planet. It creates um, almost like obsidian or volcanic glass. It creates a glassy substance. Um, a lot of Moldavite on the market now is actually just glass. It is counterfeit. If you have a loop, uh -oh. you can look in the loop underneath it. And if you see little strands in it, it's Moldavite. If you don't, it's not. Um, Moldavite is connection to higher power. It's a very high vibration crystal. I would not sleep with it under the bed. Um, if you investigate with it, uh, it could be because you're wanting to connect to space beings or uh, things like that. I actually communicate with a, I channel, I actually stream more than channel, although I channel them as well. I stream a group of entities called the George Collective. Um, and um, I connect to them naturally, but one of the ways that I can help to connect to them is I use another tektite that's like Moldavite, but it's something else. Um, 
that I got that helps me to connect to them. And I believe that they are what we came from. Um, you can call them space aliens. You can call them pieces of source. You can call them whatever you like. But my guess is, is that if you're investigating with that Moldavite, it's helping you to tune in in some way. What is it really used for? Connection to the divine, connection to higher power, understanding um, where we came from. Uh, it's very beneficial for people who are star seeds, which by the way, we all are. Some of us just maybe are closer to being a star seed because this is one of our earlier lifetimes as humans versus, um, but I believe we were all seeded by, by an alien species sometime a long time ago. I don't know if I answered your question. And yes, I would not sleep with crystals under my bed. The only crystals I would sleep with under my bed are two. One of them is amethyst. Uh, it can help with dreams and it can help with better sleep. And the other one is um, indigo gabbro, also called mystic merlinite. And that is for women of a certain age who have hot flashes when they sleep. It can help to cool those down. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Very good to know. So. I want to go back to the star seeds. So you're you're talking. I mean, part of what they're finding out is DNA could have been, and the proteins, in some ways, formed from bits and pieces of space rock that hit the Earth and created the chemical reactions and the heat necessarily to put necessary to put these together. Now, are you talking about that, or are you talking about Great Grandpa Martian sitting on the well, I don't believe in great grandpa Martian sitting on the porch with his green face and his antenna. Uh -huh. um, but I would say that um, we all came here from someone else, somewhere else. Humanity was seeded on this planet by a species from a different planet that was seeded on their planet by a species from a different planet. And that we were all seeded in these different planets for different incarnations so that we could have a human experience. It, it was a place where souls could come to play, although it doesn't always feel like play, right? But right. Where, where, where souls could come to play and that we are all seeded from that. But I also believe, so that's one of the things I mean, is that humanity comes from something else that seeded us here. And that something else comes from something else that seeded them there, that it's just this ongoing everlasting and at some point we will seed it somewhere else as well to create the ongoing experience of being human or at least being embodied for pieces of source so that they can go out and have these source ex these experiences where they know themselves as physical beings existing in duality sorry this is going real deep uh, as opposed to being pieces of source who know themselves only as love which is the inclusion of all things okay very good. Um, Makes sense. Yes. So that is that is kind of what I have come to ex understand. But I also think on an incarnation standpoint, I do not believe we are alone in the universe. And I believe that just because we are incarnated as humans this time doesn't mean that that has been every incarnation. Um, right. Because I believe we have millions of them over. We have millions of lifetimes, mm -hmm. um, thousands on Earth and elsewhere. But some people, I believe, are more recently in human bodies that have come from other places. <laughs> and they are the ones that tend to have a little bit harder time being human. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And mm -hmm. from the incarnation standpoint. And you mm -hmm. see, this is something else about Karen's books. She takes something that's really quite complicated, puts it in a pretty straightforward box was, it, was that straight talk. was that straightforward <laughs> it was to me okay. and you know it makes sense and it's right there so yeah, yeah. um my push authors that i like uh, who i believe in their books so um thank yeah. you yeah thank you're you. welcome and well then, i also believe i mean so since you're talking about me as an author i would also like to point out that i believe that everything i have ever written and everything i've ever te taught is coming not from me but coming through me from a, a a source that is um part of what i am and part of what i come from and part of what you are but that my books are not 
original new ideas and thought. They're simply streamed or channeled thought. And the difference between streaming and channeling is streaming as I'm aware I'm in doing it. Channeling means I let them take over and I have done both. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and that makes a lot of sense as well. I think that's part of my own development as well too. You connect with the, the others, the wisdom men people. I say men because I have three that are in human form, but are far surpassed above us. They're not, they're not in a physical form. They don't exist that way, but um, yeah. And I, but they could be if they wanted to. Right. But I think they've mm -hmm. gone beyond or maybe never have been. Anyway, it's it's interesting, but it's it's still that. That flow comes from someplace else and I may not directly channel channel it or stream it, but they've given me that. To think about and to ponder and to put and it's the connection with them that gives me the insight then, yes. then can come out. There and, is nothing um, new under the sun. That's right. Exactly. Yes. And um, that's also something a good historian will tell you. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, what kind of books are you working on next? What do you have coming up? You know, right now I am um, kind of taking a break. I am not working on a book right now, which is very unusual for me. Um, but it's okay because uh, I believe that the things that come to me come to me because it's what I'm supposed to be doing then. And if I was supposed to be doing a book right now, guess what? I'd be doing one right now. Right. And so I think what I'm focusing on now is more teaching and um, doing uh, coaching with people mm -hmm. and private readings and um, just kind of connecting people to help them to empower them because one of the messages that that i give which is really great marketing plan by the way is that you don't need me you are empowered you can do this yourself right. and um i kind of think that that's where i am right now that that's what i need to be doing is is teaching people to fish so that they can eat right exactly yeah yeah and and so um not working on a book right now uh not saying that there won't be more coming up but right now i'm i have two that i'm marketing and um actively promoting um the essential crystal meditation and then also the ultimate guide to psychic abilities okay and um and just kind of working on reaching out and communicating with people in whatever way i can yeah I like that. That's important. And you're getting to travel to some of your special places. And yeah. Yeah. I will actually be um, at the Edgar Casey Center in Virginia Beach later this month doing a crystal conference. It's really an honor that they asked me to be there with them. I actually taught an online um, psychic ability class earlier last month. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm really... I'm really honored that that they have reached out and asked me to work with them in this way. Oh, that's fantastic. I was referring more to places closer to home in the desert. Oh, my God. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. We just got back from Sedona. Uh, we took the kids, uh, which was lovely, my son and his wife. And it was absolutely amazing. I We go to Sedona maybe twice a year, once or twice a year. I love the desert. I would like to eventually wind up living in the desert. Uh, I My body feels better in the desert. I breathe better in the desert. And I feel a special connection to the desert, especially Sedona, but also southern Utah. And um, just that part of the country is is very special for me. So we do travel there quite a lot. You are correct. Yeah, that's um oh skinwalker Skin well Walker. okay so we have not gone to that part of utah um i am really interested <laughs> in it i have a fascination with it but that's kind of the part of utah we haven't gone to that's the northeastern part of utah right and as far north as we've gotten in in utah really is kind of uh, arches national park which is more deserty but oh right it's stunning. It really is stunning. Mm. Now, Skin Rat, Walker Ranch, I don't know, but 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm interested in it. I mostly what I'm interested in is I want to go and feel the energy and see if I can, um, uh, what I understand from it. Mm -hmm. uh, not to tell anybody else, but just because I want to see what I understand from it. Because one of the things that leads me all the time is my curiosity. Uh, the mm -hmm. reason that I have done anything I've done is because I followed my curiosity. Yeah, makes sense. And mm -hmm. from what I've been hearing, you know, online, but um, Barry and I were talking a while back, a friend who's been there about um, the ranch. And it's not just confined in those ranch borders. It's mm -mm. the neighboring ranch and such as well. And mm -hmm. so you don't even have to. There are other places right there that might be easier and more willing to let you on the property than um the actual skinwalker ranch i don't know. well well the skinwalkers are very specifically associated with the indigenous um people that are in right. the area uh but i while that may contribute to it i think that there's some more going on there that doesn't have to do with with skinwalkers it's just that that's the name that it's been branded with and so i think there's other stuff going on there and some of it i think is probably like magnetic anomalies um mm -hmm. that are affecting people and things and perception so i just kind of want to i'm very tuned into energy Right. Um, and I like to go and see what things feel like energetically to me. That's why I like to go places is because I just want to, I want to know how things feel. Exactly. And there are natural sources of radiation that can create radioactive gases like radon that can, I mean, mm -hmm. I live in Portland. That's been a big problem at times for places. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, oh, there's so many other things. If I flash those too fast, tell me. But um, the um, um, oh, I was going to say it's it's hard to know, and it's also hard to know what kind of activities taken on that could have created created bio hazards or something that create these feelings. And I don't know, maybe. You, I, I have seen a UFO. I'm not going to say it's from outer space. It's unidentified. But it was big and saucer-shaped and many stories of colored lights and not very far away and moved in interesting um, ways and went down behind a hill in uh, not far from me along the Malala River. When I was in high school, we had some property there. And I was there with a friend at midnight just it was a cool place to hang out and chat and um, we didn't do drugs and we weren't drinking and we almost went to go find it. And then we thought, uh Oh, we might find it. So we went home. Well, you know, I have never seen, no, that's not true. We were flying home from San Diego. Um, Oh gosh, maybe three years ago now. And um, I saw something from the plane. But that's kind of been my only experience. But I will tell you, I have interviewed Stanton Friedman many, many times. He's, of course, passed um, now. Mm -hmm. But my conversations with that man have have truly led me to believe that there is a lot out there. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I know he was kind of a character, but he was also a very, very smart man and had done a lot of research. So, Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm so skeptical. I need to see something to believe it. But um, I, I know there's something. I just, I'm not going to say what. Universe is too big for there to not be something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I read The Wrinkle in Time when I was a kid. <gasps> That was and one of my favorite books when I was a mine kid. Mine too. Mm -hmm. And absolutely. We, why not be able to travel that way? And um, Or like um, Carl Sagan's Contact. I loved that book. Or um, The Sparrow. I haven't read those. Mary Doria Russell. Oh, you, you would probably really like it, William. It's called The Sparrow. And it's um, a novel, but it's about a... Uh, Jesuit priest who 
travels into outer space. It's an incredibly good book. Yeah. That sounds like it. I like the Jesuits too. Dan, I do think that we could manifest our own monsters. As a matter of fact, uh, I told a story at the ghost conference about it wasn't a monster, but I believe I manifested my own poltergeist. So yes, I do think that we can manifest our own monsters by our fears and our beliefs and our attention. I believe that um, where your attention goes is what you often create. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some good questions have been mm -hmm. coming up. I appreciate it from people. Um, mm -hmm. And and Dan's been uh, one of our our big uh, commenters, so it's great. He's a personal friend, so I have to. Cool. Uh, I, I kind of got that. I got that. Maybe. Yeah. I, there were a couple things I didn't post, but um, <laughs> <laughs> or share. Okay. But, <laughs> um. How do people get a hold of you and your books and your teachings and your lectures and all that? Well, the, the easiest way to find me is um, through my website, which is authorkarenfraser.com. It's spelled F-R-A-Z-I-E-R, -E just like on the screen, right? Um, uh -huh. Authorkarenfraser.com. And also, I I kind of the gateway to that is through Instagram um, or Facebook. And those are both author K Fraz, K F R A Z. And my books are sold anywhere, anywhere books are sold. I mean, I think a lot of them mostly are on Amazon, but they're in, I see them in metaphysical bookstores and stuff all the time. Still, by the way, I always take a picture because I'm like, oh my God, they got my book. So, yeah. And well, they've been in Barnes and Noble and places yeah. like that too. Yeah, so. it never gets old. It never gets old seeing your books in a store. It's always exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Are there any last minute questions? Um, for people from people what are the biggest challenges we face as paranormal investigators i think the biggest challenges we face as paranormal investigators are our own egos um i do i i think that that we want so badly to confirm what we think we believe that sometimes we forget to just be with the experience and allow the experience without trying to interpret it and turn it into a story that we can tell. Right. Um, and so I think our ego takes us out of the experience, either because we're skeptical and we're like, oh, well, this isn't happening, or because we're thinking about what, you know, how it fits into our own stories. And if you can, for the moment, when you're in the middle of an investigation, simply be in the investigation and be in the space and have the experience without analyzing, without thinking about it, just have the experience without looking at your equipment. Um, people miss more crap looking at their equipment. <laughs> if, exactly. if you would only look up, if you would only look up. Um, so I just think allow yourself to be in the space and be in the moment. And then the other thing is that there is not always, but there is a certain level of closed mindedness in the field that has become almost as dogmatic as other things. Um, and I think that skepticism can be too dogmatic because skepticism is actually open-mindedness. It's approaching it with an open-minded and seeing what happens, right? Exactly. Um, and so I do think that we get so caught up in our skepticism that we, again, don't allow ourselves to have the experience. Yeah, I've seen that happen with people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think I'd add other people's egos because sometimes one of the enemies we have is certain people and I, I wouldn't name names if i could if one popped into my head right now but there have been many cases where locations no longer allow people to come in to explore from a paranormal sense because of the actions of others yeah everybody um, everybody wants to be the next zach bagans right right and um i have pretty strict rules when i'm doing an event um you don't antagonize them. How would you feel? You know. No, these are people without bodies. Um, yeah. Respect them just as you would respect anybody else, for sure. Remember, this takes a lot of work. Respect to one another as always. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. does take a lot of work, and there is nobody who knows everything. There's nobody who has every answer. There, there are a lot of people who think they have every answer, but the truth is, is that 
we are looking at something that we have no way of really being able to prove outside of social scientific methods used by the SPR and um, similar organizations, right? Exactly. And so even those, I think that we have, we can't discount experiences because we don't have science to explain them. Right. Just because the science doesn't exist to explain them right now, doesn't mean it won't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, our... When you see something, we see something. When we feel something, we feel it. Now, sometimes there's a reason for that that isn't what we think. But yeah, when, when you're out in the middle of nowhere and there aren't any strange gases or overhead power lines and you get this strange feeling or you see this being that's walking up and down the, the plane, um, there's something there. I mean, well, and that's, I think that that raises another good point, William. And that's that um, if we are truly in this, so first of all, we're in this because we want to understand, right? We're all curious people who want to understand, but we're also working with spirits who may not understand what it is they're doing. Um, and we're also working with human beings who right. are having experiences that can sometimes feel scary and traumatic. Yes. And what they don't need is someone coming in and dismissing those because it doesn't fit into a, a picture that we have. And, right. and so um, I would say just approach everything with compassion, approach other people's findings with comp compassion, approach other people's experiences with compassion mm -hmm. and recognize that just because you haven't had the experience doesn't mean that that experience wasn't incredibly real to them and affected them in some way that's significant. Right. And with me, a lot of times, because like I say, I'm, I have to see so often to, I have to at least see it once to know that it fully yeah. exists. That doesn't mean I don't believe people when they have had Absolutely. an I haven't had. I, I just, before I can say this is a hundred percent, this kind of a thing, I I need something more, but I believe them that they had their experience. And yeah, you need to just, that's exactly it, is that people need to feel heard and witnessed. And yeah. I actually, um, I believe in meeting people where they are. And sometimes those experiences may be coming out of other things, but yeah. I, I just think that you meet people where they are, um, regardless of where that is. And you affirm that where they are is where they should be right now. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, you know, we learn. I always learn. People take my classes and I learn too. Yeah, I learn a lot from, from the people who take my classes and come mm -hmm. to me. They always ask such good questions and it's like, oh, huh. they make me and think. Exactly. And sometimes they're having a different approach to something that I hadn't thought of before or experienced before that. Is oh yeah, fascinating or interesting. Whether or not it's something that would work for me is irrelevant. It's just a whole nother piece that can help me as a teacher. Yeah, I know a little bit about a lot of things, but I don't know a lot about anything. Right. And it would be really arrogant of me to think that I did know a lot about a lot of things because I don't. I know what I know based on my own observations and experiences, but mm -hmm. I don't know that those things are true either. No, uh, one of the things I feel is we may be told what we need to be told to, because what is real is beyond our ability to understand with this type of a brain and body. Um, Absolutely. And so the journey continues and it's fascinating. And I really encourage people to explore it but explore it with people you can trust. Um, don't jump into things. I've known people who have jumped in just willy-nilly without a good enough foundation of oh, critical thinking, analytics, um, among other things, and have wound up in, in trouble a bit. Um, yeah. They get out of it, but, you know, it's. But maybe um, it's not in trouble. Maybe that's an experience they needed to have. 
follow your that, curiosity. That's my that's, that's my big advice. Yeah, and I agree with you. I I just I'm a Capricorn. Follow your curiosity, but do it wisely. <laughs> I'm a Sagittarius, so I believe run in full force, willy nilly, and just have the experience because ultimately, no matter what, in the universal sense, you are safe. That's true. What crystals would you recommend to help quieten them? Um, so my house is actually surrounded with smoky quartz. I bought smoky quartz chips and I actually surrounded my house with them. Um, mm -hmm. After I cleansed it first, I cleansed it with sound and with Palo Santo all through the house. And then I sprinkled smoky quartz all around the house because it transmutes negative energy into positive energy. So only good energy is coming into my house. If you are having a problem in your house I with spirits, I would recommend before you start trying to do things to quiet them down or banish them or things like that, that you have a conversation with them and you say, this yep. is making me very uncomfortable. I appreciate you that you feel like this is where you need to be. Can you do it in a way that is no longer bothering my pets, my children, me, um, you know, turning my stove on, whatever it is. Uh, and then that you consult with somebody who, who understands the specific energy of the space, because it would kind of be irresponsible for me to say, use this crystal because it would, it would vary based on what's causing the energy and what the energy is coming from. Right. That sounds yeah. good. I think that's true too. Yep. Mm -hmm. I do. Uh, well, we've bad at the end. Do you have anything else that you would like to add? Karen? This no, I mean, wish me luck. We're going to Costco on a Saturday. Remember the filter on the empath. Absolutely. I Tune it down. The Tune yeah, it down. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yep. I do. Uh-huh. So um, it's been incredibly wonderful to have a chance to visit with you again. I don't get to do that enough. And, no, I um, know. Um, yeah, it's it it's been a great pleasure. Sorry, I no, it's okay. No. We always need to. Can we get the I wish? Uh, yeah. I I want mine to vacuum. Quite frankly, I I just the I guess there is one other thing I want to say, William, and this is important because uh, we both have a friend who died recently. Yes, and it's a reminder to sorry, spend the time with the people you love. Yes. And exactly. let them know how you feel. I had closure because the last time I saw him, I hugged him and I told him I loved him because I knew that I, I knew that there was because he'd been sick for so long. I knew that there was a possibility always that it was the last time. And right. why don't we do that with everyone? Why do we wait until we, you know, because you, you have regrets if you don't. So when you yes. just when you said to me, you know, we don't talk enough. Well, that's really stupid. Because talk to the people you love. I'm sorry. Now I'm making you upset. No, you're not making me upset. Um, you're making my heart awake and feel loved and joyful. So yeah. So I mean, take that time. Right. It's it's mm -hmm. important. Um, and yeah. even though they come to us after they die, and and he has um, to you, yes. to me, to a lot of people, it's not the same as being in their physical presence, and mm -hmm. therefore just say the things that you need to say to, to people and spend the time that you need and don't think that you're going to have more time because sometimes you don't. Exactly. I, yeah. I think he's the one that turned on the patio light the other day. Oh, he crashed one of my readings a couple weeks ago. Okay. That's, yeah. that's like him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. I'm sure he was absolutely thought it was hilarious. He, and I'll tell you off of the air what he did. If Kristen didn't tell you what, what happened at our memorial that we did. So, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thank you everybody. I really appreciate you all being there and um, let's see. And put that one up. Thank you. And I appreciate your questions, Dan. Yeah, I do too. And we'll all talk soon. Bye-bye, everybody.